Hello, everybody. Welcome. Sorry, we're a minute or two late. We're having a little bit of an issue with the uh, the live streaming. So I am not 100% sure if that's going to be happening. I know Blaine is working on that. So uh, apologies for a couple of minutes tardy. But welcome. So glad you guys are here. Um, if you guys want, you can post questions down in the Q&A section or over here in the webinar chat. After I go through my whole presentation, I will get to your questions. I'm gonna to get to as many of the questions as possible, but I do wanna make sure that we, uh, we do respect everybody's time. So if I don't get to your questions, sometimes we get a lot, sometimes we get a few, but if we get a lot of questions, uh, just post them in, in the, um, the comments box. And we will be recording this session. Uh, we will be sending this out on a replay. So uh, if you're watching this live, welcome. If you're watching this on a recording, welcome. So tonight's really interesting conversation we're gonna have. We're gonna dive into the topic of carotenoids and cataracts. And more specifically, we're gonna talk a lot about the effects of UV radiation and blue light, blue light that comes off our screens and how that can impact the carotenoid levels and how they can contribute to cataracts. So uh, really interesting information and very, very relevant because uh, we all use phones and now it's summertime, people are outside and UV radiation is absolutely a thing. We're gonna talk about how and why it could affect your vision, why it's important to have blue light uh, protection on your glasses and also uh, why you wanna have sunglasses. So without any further ado, let me uh, post disabled screen sharing. Let's get that going, Blaine. Give us a second here. So we're gonna get Blaine to uh, make sure we got screen sharing. Aha, here we go. Thanks, buddy. Okay. So here we go. We're gonna start the uh, slideshow from beginning. Here we go. All right. So here we are officially cataracts and carotenoids protecting your eyes. That's what this whole um, pro this, this conversation is about. We are gonna get into your questions. I know a lot of people are asking about uh, getting cataract surgery and prevention and stuff like that. And we will absolutely get to that. So again, I will go through the presentation. Uh, it should be about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll absolutely get to your questions. So let's start out with what are cataracts, all right? That's the first thing we want to look at. So a cataract is actually a clouding of the lens, which sits behind the cornea of your eye. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a visual of that in a second. Uh, and it's a clouding or an opacity that forms on the clear lens. It's basically like a, a clear window that turns dirty uh, because it either dehydrates or oxidated stress. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. Most cataracts are related to aging, the aging process, they're age-related or senile cataracts, uh, and they're, mo they're very common as, as we age. Uh, by age 80, more than half Americans either have cataracts or have had cataract surgery. So, uh, Basically, if you live long enough, you're going to get cataracts right now um, with what we have. There's not a ton of prevention, but we are gonna talk about that, things that we can do to slow it. Um, there is some research coming out of Israel that they're actually looking at a eye drop that actually uh, reverses the protein cross-linking that happens that actually causes the, uh, the lens to, to uh, become opaque. So a cataract occurs uh, in, in either eye, it's not necessarily going to happen in the both, both eyes at the same time. You could develop one in one eye and not in the other. Um, and it's not really something that's going to spread. It's just kind of like one starts to oxi one lens starts to oxidize and degenerate and become opaque. And then ultimately it could happen to the other. Again, it could be an eye. It, there could be a lot of factors we're going to talk about. So what happens is like UV light is absorbed by the lens, causing oxidative stress and clouding. And we'll talk a little bit more about the causes. So this is what happens when you see cataracts. So if you look over here at the right down here, this is an advanced stage cataracts where, where the lens really becomes cloudy and opaque. It almost looks milky. And what happens is this cataract area over here, the, the more ripe it gets, that's the term, or more advanced the cataract or, or thicker the, cap, the, the cataract gets, meaning the, the, the clear crystalline lens goes from a clear window, like a picture window, to this, this, this opaque, uh, dark, darker, uh, uh, hazy area, uh, things will start to look 
hazy. It kind of looks like you have a smudge on your glasses. You want to clean it and you just keep trying to clear your glasses and it doesn't clear. So if you feel like you got a smudgy eyes, also when you go outside, if there's a lot of sun glare, like the, the light bothers you and it, sound, it feels like it's glare, like a foggy or a hazy vision, it feels like it's kind of smoky. Those are all indicators that, that you may have cataracts developing. And um, uh, everybody should be going to their eye doctors. Uh, I, I recommend at least twice a year. If your eyes are in really good shape, uh, if you don't have eye issues, then you know two years is good, maybe once a year, but absolutely no less than twice a year. Uh, if you have eye issues, you know, anything from six months to, to once a year to get that monitored. Um, but this is kind of what we were looking at from a physiological standpoint in terms of, of cataract formation. So again, we have age-related cataracts that happen as we age, the body oxidizes into hydrates and it's just part of the aging process. Uh, or we could also have early onset cataracts, which happen a lot of the time uh, in cases like metabolic conditions, or systemic uh, disease processes, or early stage eye diseases like juvenile macular generation called Stargardt's, or uh, retinitis pigmentosa, or people get ocular Lyme or diabetic retinopathy. So any eye conditions that are uh, start at an earlier age, either like really young, we have like little kids who come in with, with who, who can get these cataracts pretty early, or up into teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, which are still considered pretty young to get cataracts, um, they're usually precipitated by these uh, other conditions, these other inflammatory conditions that cause, again, things like oxidative stress and dehydration of the lens and the whole eye system. So that's why they show up. The heat from the inflammation from these eye conditions pretty much pretty much cooks the lens. So um, it's it's often said that uh, cataracts is like like a hard boiling egg. So if you think of like the white that's kind of jelly and everything like that and clear, and as you you heat it, what happens is we get this protein crosslinking, and what happens is that makes the lens opaque and and, and non transparent. So those of you guys have been following uh, the these lectures. Uh, we always go back to our three main factors that rob vision, uh, any part of the eye. Uh, poor circulation, which is blood flow, which can also be oxygen and nutrition to the eye and detoxification. Inflammatory process, again, and we've covered a lot of these. Today, we're really going to talk about oxidative stress. That's one of the big uh, factors in, uh, in, in um, cataract formation and uh, carotenoids that we we're talking about as well are, a, are an antioxidant. So it's a strategy and a nutritional tool that we use to help protect our eyes. So the functional causes of cataracts, why do we get cataracts, right? We talked about it, there's definitely an age-related process. There's definitely a juvenile cataracts that are usually a result of an early stage eye disease or a systemic inflammatory disease. Um, of course, we can have radiation, which we're gonna go into very, very, Big detail today. We're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, specifically, UV light, ultra, ultraviolet radiation, and blue light. Inflammation, of course, can can cook the lens, as we just talked about a little earlier. Dehydration, the lens dries out. If any of you guys ever had con contact lenses uh, and you forget to either put the saline solution in, you'll see they go from a clear lens to like a like a turbid. They actually they're not very clear when they dry out. That's the same thing that happens to your lens. Uh, and oxidative stress, of course, which we know is accelerated aging and free radical damage, uh, kind of rusting of the body, which is pretty much the aging process. So that's what happens to the lens and to most degenerative eye conditions, when either we're talking about the retina or the optic nerve or the um, different parts of the eyes. So again, free radicals, stress or oxidative stress uh, is again, where free radicals attack your body and damage your DNA cells, tissues and organs causing oxidative stress. The cumulative damage leads to disease and accelerated aging, right? It's an accelerated aging process that can be locally, in this case, the eyes or the brain or systemically, right? Where do we usually see oxidative stress? Where is it most apparent? Like when we look at people, the skin, right? You know, you see people who remember back in the seventies, we used to like sit and kind of you know, put on baby oil or, you know, and we all kind of did that if you're, if you're old enough, you know, we didn't know. So uh, the ozone layer was also a little thicker back then. So you could kind of get away with it. 
But what happened is we oxidized our skin. So you see premature aging. You can see age spots prematurely, uh, a lot of moles, beauty marks, stuff like that, sagging skin. You lose the elasticity. So again, people who are, you know, they look, don't look age appropriate. So they may, you know, it doesn't matter how old they are, but if they've spent a lot of time in the sun, smoking cigarettes, exposed to chemicals, uh, drinking a lot of alcohol, anything that accelerates oxidative stress, they take a lot of medication, or they've had a lot of disease process, or they've dealt with a lot of stress in their lives. All of these factors uh, amplify and accelerate oxidative stress. So one of the places that we, we generally look for that is just looking at somebody's appearance, right? Do they look like their, their weather, their body's like starting to, to generate? We can see that in the quality of the skin. So there are specific antioxidants. I'm sure everybody at this point has heard the term antioxidants. And again, what they do is combat or slow and manage the oxidative stress, oxidative stress process. Um, which is normal. We need some level of oxidation because it breaks down and decomposes. And uh, it's kind of like the garbage, uh, the garbage matter of our body. We break down uh, toxins and waste products and we oxidize those so our body can get rid of it. What happens when it becomes a pathology is when the body can't control it. There's so many free radicals uh, in our body. It's almost like, you know, little, similar like little viruses or little toxins that go around just destroying Again, our tissues, our cells, our DNAs, our organs, our, our sense organs, in this case, our eyes, and they just, they just wreak havoc and they just, they just really degenerate our internal environment uh, and our, not only our structural health, but our functional health as well. So let's talk a little bit about UV radi radiation because excessive ultraviolet, radi uh, excessive ultraviolet radiation damages both the, ren the lens and the retina. I can't speak too well today. So let's start by looking at the three types of UV rays, okay? So we know there's visible light in the, uh, the light spectrum, and then we have UVA rays, all right? UVA rays account for about 95% of the UV radiation that penetrates through the eye to the, to the retina, all right? We know the retina is, you know, if we see over here, lines the whole back of the eye, similar to how, if you guys have ever seen like a tennis ball and cut it open, there's the, the black rubber inside the tennis ball. It's very similar. That's how the uh, the, the retina lines the back of the eye, and that's where all the photoreceptors are, the rods and the cones, which allow us to see, right? Light goes through the lens to the back of the eye, it hits the retina, and those, um, those light impulses are converted into chemical impulses, which are then converted into electrical impulses that are sent through the optic nerve, through the brain, to the visual cortex. So this, that whole process. So what happens is the, the UV rays are really the one, they don't get there as much as blue light, which you're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, the UV rays will generally affect a little bit more of the anterior part of the eyes, but UV rays are the, the, the UV rays that can be harmful to the eye. And they, they do penetrate through the cornea, through the lens, and they will go back to the back of the eye. UVB rays, not so much. They'll usually stay more at the, the cornea and the lens in the front part of the eye. So they can, again, cause oxidative stress and accelerated aging to the anterior compartment of the eye. They can cause, uh, you know, things like uh, strigium, and they can start, uh, cause things like, um, you know, styes and, you know, things around the eyes. It could, it could uh, affect the, the conjunctiva and the overall health of what we call the anterior compartment, which basically means the front of the eye. So again, the, UV, <coughs> the UVA rays, uh, conversely, will affect the back of the eye. Not, again, not as much as the blue light, which we're gonna talk about in a little while. Um, but it's good to know that the UVA, UVA rays are gonna to get to the back of the eye. The UVB rays will mostly stay in effect the, the, the anterior compartment of the eye, not the posterior compartment. And UVC rays aren't really an issue for us. Most of them are absorbed by the ozone layer. But as the ozone layer starts to decrease, which we all know that's been going on, um, that could be an issue down the line if that's not managed. Um, Great, let's talk now about blue light and how blue light. So the big thing with blue light is it goes right to the, it just goes rapidly. It bypass, bypasses the anterior compartment and it goes right to the retina and the optic nerve and actually even into the brain. The brain actually absorbs a lot of the blue light, all right? So it's just below the visible light spectrum. You guys can see right here, we have near infrared, then we have visible light, then we have blue light, which is kind of like just below 
the violets and the indigos, you know, that, that we have on the lower spectrum of visible, visible, visible light. And then we, of course, get into the UVC, UVB, and UVA, which are more at the bottom. And the, uh, we said the UVAs, you know, will affect the anterior compartment, but they will also, you know, get to some level of the, the posterior compartment, the back of the eye and the retina, not nearly as much as the blue light though. So we really need to be careful guys. So we're gonna talk a little bit on what we need to do, but I want you guys to, to be aware of this. I want to show you guys, give you guys an image so you can see that the blue light really, really impacts the back of the eye. Okay, very, very significant. You know, we're on, we're on our phones, we're on our laptops and you know, all the time. You know, sometimes we're spending like maybe two or three hours a day, but a lot of us are spending, you know, 12, 14 hours and, you know, now we have the, the LED lights too. The LED lights, they're, they're starting to show research that that provides a lot of strain on the retina too. So I didn't put much of that inside this, this, this presentation, but just keep in mind too, if you notice that you're sensitive, if you, you kind of, that's pretty much all you can get now at Home Depot and, um, you know, uh, Lowe's and any of the hardware stores, you can, they're pretty much just selling the LEDs. Why? Because they're more energy efficient, but they're a lot brighter and it's a lot more stress on our eyes. Look, guys, we, we how, how long have we been using computers, right? 25 years, maybe 30 years regularly. Okay, if you're an accountant, maybe use like a Smith Corona or like one of the older computers, maybe 35 years at the most. Um, our eyes have not evolved to be able to handle this type of radiation that comes in. So we need protection. We need nutritional protection. We need glasses protection. We need to, you know, do our work with our screens to help protection. We're going to talk more about that in a little while. So this is the take home. I really want you guys to, to look at this. I, I, I found this image. I, it really summarized this entire uh, point here. So the UV and blue light effects on the eyes. The UV ultraviolet radiation really affects the anterior compartment. So that's the sunlight. Okay, UV blue light does come from the sun as well. Uh, just it's more of the, the UV light. So the blue light that comes from the sun is going to damage the, the back of the eye and the blue light that comes from screens is going to damage the back of the eye, the retina and the optic nerve. The UV radiation is primarily going to get hung up and oxidize the, the lens causing cataracts. Okay. So for those people who have uh, cataracts and they don't they have healthy retinas and the rest of the eye and optic nerves in good shape, uh, we're really looking at, you know, protecting against UV radiation, which everybody knows about pretty much at this point. Um, for those people who have retinal conditions um, or optic nerve issues or showing signs of degeneration, or you're on computers all the time, like you don't want to get macular degeneration, you don't want to get glaucoma or uh, risk of retinal detachment because all this flickering and everything and all this blue light energy uh, is radiation again. And what it can do is it actually can start to dry out the retina. And what happens when you dry out the retina, you can get tears. You can get vitreous detachments. You can get full-blown retinal detachments, okay? Because it causes inflammation and it really starts to cook the retina a little bit. So I just want you guys to appreciate the level of stress that computers, sunlight, and, and um, LED lights can put on our eyes. And we just need to be aware of that and just manage it, right? We can't get rid of it. Can't get rid of the sun. Can't get rid of computers. Most of us are on screens. But I just want you guys to be aware of, of what's going on here. So... Um, this is this is a really good slide for you guys. So let's talk about carotenoids now. So carotenoid antioxidants, um, they are antioxidants that protect the posterior compartment of the eye. All right, we talked about the anterior compartment. First, we're going to talk about how to protect the posterior compartment. That's the retina, the macula, the fovea, the optic nerve, the whole neurological uh, nerve layer, the photoreceptors, again, the rods and conus. So what are carotenoid antioxidants? A lot of you guys have, have heard of these supplements before, things like vitamin A, beta carotene, retinal palmitate, lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, lycopene. All these, uh, these, these, these supplements are, are very, very useful for, um, for most conditions with, with, uh, with, with these eye conditions. Now, we know uh, folks with Stargardt's macular dystrophy uh, are, are we, we think there's some research that shows that they have a difficult time breaking down vitamin A, beta carotene, retinal palmitate. So people with Stargardt's disease, juvenile macular generation, are going to use a little bit more of the lutein, zeaxanthin, and astaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, and use more nutrition because there seems to be some issue, not with everybody, but with some people breaking down 
the vitamin A and it causes more accumulation of, of metabolic waste products. So that is what we want. Those are the, those are the supplements. So um, yeah, I wanted to show you that. So creatinine antioxidants, what do they do, all right? What they do in our body when we take a creatinine antioxidants, when we eat a carrot, right? Carotenoids come from carrot, the root word. So they protect our body from UV radiation, not just our eyes, but our entire body. And they, they also protect some, some protection against blue light and the radiation from, from the LED lights, okay? So the carotenoids are a real, real, real protector for the blue light and the, the UV light. So we really need to protect the back of the eye with uh, creatinine antioxidants. So there's another interesting fact I'm gonna show you guys uh, that, that's related to the eyes. That is, so in our clinic, it's so, we've decided it's so important, or I've decided it's so important to know what your carotenoid antioxidants level that we actually test for them in our clinic. Uh, we, there are a lot of ways to test. We used to test through blood serum, so patients have to go get a, a, a finger prick or they'd have to get blood drawn. It was really expensive. It was like a five or $700 test. But now we, we found this technology where they actually scan your carotenoid levels from your skin. And there's research out that I'm gonna show you guys, uh, link to that in a minute, that actually tested and showed that, so understand, let me back up for a minute. So understanding that carotenoid antioxidants protect our body against UV radiation and blue light, the two parts of our bodies that are most susceptible to damage, radiation damage from UV radiation and blue light are what? The eyes, we already talked about that, and the skin, right? So when we take a carotenoid antioxidant, it protects our retina from the radiation from blue light and uh, and UV radiation, but it also protects our skin, right? We know our skin, too much sun exposure can uh, render us susceptible to skin cancer. So taking carotenoid antioxidants and making sure your levels are high, not only are you going to protect your vision, they're also going to protect your skin against carotenoid, you're also going to protect for yourself against skin cancer. So during the summer, you know, you got, we're all outside now, uh, you know, in the sun a little bit more, enjoying the, the nice weather, our body is chewing up a lot more of the carotenoid antioxidants. So the summertime, you want to take more carotenoids. In the winter, maybe not as much, unless we're going on vacation or something like that to a nice sunny spot, which nobody is doing too much right now because of the COVID-19 situation. So let's go back to the testing. So what we do in our clinic is patients come in. It's a non-invasive test. It's kind of like a, a, I'm going to use my water bottle here, but they pretty much put your hands on it and it actually reads the carotenoid levels in your skin, how much saturation is there. And then we have a scale here that goes from about 60,000, from 10,000 to 60,000. And we actually grade this. So this is like a fuel tank. So the, the right hand side is like a full tank. The left hand side, the red area is gonna be an empty tank. And up in the middle will be about half tank. So we evaluate where patients are out. So that lets us know, like, oh, well, I'm taking four milligrams of zeaxanthin. You know, very specific. A lot of people about the numbers they're taking because they've read research. I don't care how much you're taking or not taking. We a need to know that you're taking enough to get the levels where you need to have the appropriate protection, and we need to know that the 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 form that you're taking or the quantity and the quality of carotenoid antioxidant you're taking are actually being absorbed into your body, and your body's making use of them. So fresh fruits and vegetables have them in quality supplements. Those are the two ways to get your carotenoid antioxidants. Now, we talked about free radicals chew up these carotenoid antioxidants. Things like smoke, everything we're told to, not to do, who have eye diseases, right? You have macular degeneration, right? Stop smoking. Um, inflammation, again, inflammation can come from a host of things. Uh, stress, poor diet, injury, illnesses, viruses, bacteria, autoimmune processes, um, uh, chemical exposure, radiation exposure. There's so many things that could be pro-inflammatory. So we want to be sophisticated and source the inflammation. We can't just say, oh yeah, here, take turmeric because of the inflammation. No, we need to source it and find out why the inflammation is there and, and where the origin is. Also pollution, right? Environmental pollution, that becomes internal pollution. That's crappy food, air pollution, uh, poor air quality, um, you know, any, any uh, you know, aerosols or, or um, GMOs or uh, pesticides or you know too much pharmaceutical medi medications or recreational 
or alcohol, too much alcohol or drugs or stuff like that, that pollutes the body, right? It causes more toxins. So that toxicity requires the body to break down the toxins through oxidative stress. So the body's going to increase that, that, that uh, activity. Um, being overweight sometimes can cause oxidative stress. We don't have it here, but being underweight too, people who are like, you know, unhealthy underweight are very, very oxidized usually because their body is just inflamed and um, there's a lot of oxidative stress. So uh, here they said too, too much weight, being overweight, but also being way too underweight can cause oxidative stress. Um, excessive exercise, overtraining, you know, it's supposed to be healthy, all these Ironman trainers and everything. I'm all about that. But um, a lot of these, these tra people who are training, uh, they don't do, do it in a healthful way. And they essentially redline their metabolisms. And when you redline your metabolism, you cause more oxidative stress and, and metabolic breakdown of, of your fat tissues, of your muscle and the protein, the amino acids start to break down. So, and also stress. Stress is arguably one of the number one causes of free radical uh, consumption, uh, consumption of uh, the creatinine antioxidants. So again, carotenoid antioxidants, what they do is they offer protection, guys. This is your insurance policy. It protects your cells from oxidation, just like we use this analogy here of an apple, right? You guys ever uh, cut an apple or a piece of fruit, you let it sit for like, I don't know, even like five or 10 minutes, or certainly after a half hour, it's going to start to turn brown. Why? Because the fructose, which is the sugar in fruit, is very unstable. And as soon as oxygen gets to it, it starts to oxidize, right? And that, it, it starts to turn brown and rot and you get the brown spots. That's the same thing that happens to our skin, happens to our brain, happens to our heart, happens to our retinas, happens. It's the same process, right? You can get all the way down to the DNA level and cause gene signaling and mutations. Oxidative stress is that powerful. It can actually cause gene mutations. Um, so free radicals in your body, again, it's very, very important that we have them. But when, again, when they get out of control, they cause a systemic breakdown and destruction of certain parts of the body. Okay. Um, here's that study I was talking about, the correlation between macular skin and serum carotenoids, um, just for those fact checkers. <laughs> okay. So foods high in carotenoid antioxidants are basically your orange foods, all right? Your oranges and your greens. So we have different types of carotenoid antioxidants. We have the alpha carotenes, which are found in foods like pumpkin, carrots, uh, plantain, squash, collard greens. Okay, then we have beta carotene, which is another molecule that, again, are found in carrots, leafy greens, sweet potatoes, one of my all-time favorites, cantaloupe, which is my grandfather's all-time favorites, uh, and pumpkin, you know, um, pumpkin pie or... Uh, just, just pumpkin generally is, is pretty good, you know, uh, canned pumpkin, not so much, but you can like juice it and, you know, kind of, um, you know, make, make, uh, like pumpkin soup is really good. Actually, you can make a really good pumpkin soup. Uh, lycopene, we know those are primarily found in tomatoes, but also papayas, grapefruit, especially the red grapefruit, the ruby red grapefruits, and even watermelon, right? So make sure you get your ly lycopene, have some watermelon. I love in the summertime juicing watermelon. It's so refreshing if you guys haven't done that. And you could even take it and like, if, if you want, in Chinese medicine, we're not so big, big on ice drinks, but you know, sometimes in the summer you have to, uh, you, know, to, to you know, have a little you know, cold, refreshing drink. Um, what we do sometimes is you can actually take that and then freeze it and make like, um, you know, ice pops out of, out of a watermelon, which is a great treat. And you also get your lycopenes, your creatinine antioxidants. Uh, same thing with, uh, you can mix that with pink grapefruit if you like a little bit more of a citrusy, which is refreshing in the summer. And then lutein and zeaxanthin are uh, really common. You know, they, they've got a lot of uh, attention, of course, over the past 10 years, over the last decade. And those are really your leafy green vegetables. Uh, summer and winter squash, squash, Brussels sprouts are a phenomenal source of lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, I'm a huge fan of Brussels sprouts. Uh, and yellow, yellow corn, too. So summertime, you, people eating a lot of corn now. Um, and then um, uh, the, the beta cryptanthin is uh, pumpkin, papaya, sweet potato, uh, sweet pepper, rather, uh, and orange. Orange, you know, is summertime, summertime fruit, too. So a lot of these are summer fruits. So it's a really great time, guys. So we talked about you guys are going to be in the sun. We're going to be out. We're going to be enjoying maybe the beach, the pool, the lake. You know, you're on the river, just, you know, hanging out in your backyard, social distancing. <laughs> whatever. Um, but consume these fruits, you know, put out platters or make juices and, 
you know, uh, how, how use these foods, you know, during the day, during the summer to protect your body, not only protect your eyes, but protect your skin against, uh, you know, both blue light and UV radiation. So let's shift over to cataracts and cataract surgery, because that's one of the most, um, the biggest questions, the most frequently asked question that I get from my patients and just from, from people who shoot me emails. So here's something that I want you to remember, we saw the picture of the cataract and how it starts to get thicker and thicker and opaque. Now what happens is as that cataract on the lens ripens and it gets thicker and thicker and more opaque, it actually blocks the UV rays that are coming into the eye, right? So it acts as a natural sunglass. Great, right? It protects the retina and it protects the retina from the UV radiation and the blue light, right? Because we talked earlier, we said the UV rays are heavily absorbed by the, by the lens of the eye, by the anterior compartment. So most of the UV rays are filtered out by the lens, but some do get to the back of the eye. And we know, of course, the blue light absolutely bypasses the lens, goes right to the back of the eye. Cataract surgery can be risky. So check this out. So if you've, say, say you've had a cataract, it's been brewing for like 10, 15 years or something like that, and the cataract's like really thick and it's really been protecting the back of the eye and the retina, you're using sunglasses and you have cataracts and you know, you're, you're taking carotenoids and, or, or maybe you haven't been, your carotenoid levels aren't very high and you go for cataract surgery and they take out the, the thick, you know, opaque lens that's been your natural sunglasses that you had in there and they put it in with clear lens. Now what's going to happen? We have all this UV and blue light radiation that had been blocked out by the cataract. So your redness starts freaking out. They actually can get sunburned because they've gone so long, it's like, you know, they're like pasty, you know, they're like from Northern Ireland or Northern Canada or Northern Siberia or something. They haven't seen the sun in forever. So they're like this, this Casper pasty, you know, send them down to the Bahamas and they, they get fried. That's pretty much happened. Your eyes are not used to this exposure to UV radiation and blue light. So it stresses them out. It causes inflammation and, you know, oxidative stress and uh, it, it really, it, it actually can sunburn them. So your, your, your retinas get really, really stressed out. That's why when people get cataract surgery and they have either thin retinas or they have pre-existing conditions like macular generation or glaucoma or, or uh, retinitis pigmentosa or, um, you know, maybe a, a partial detached retina or retinal tear or something like that or thinning retinas, is you've got, you've had this protection you get rid of the protection. Of course, the anterior compartment is now clear. You can see better, but there's so much, you know, trauma and your, your, the retinas are freaking out because they're not used to having to deal with all this sunlight. That's why it's so important to really make sure that we're using blue light protection. We're going to talk about strategies for handling this in a minute. So when you, when you, if you're dealing with this and you have a pre-existing degenerative acute or degenerative eye condition that's affecting your retina or your optic nerve, you want to make sure that you're talking to the cataract surgeon who's had experience with this. So I've seen so many, you know, botched up cataract surgeries and patients who've, you know, gone for cataract surgery and it's gotten so much worse um, just because there is no, uh, there was no work done on, on the front end, but prior to getting cataract surgery to really prevent damage, to load up on the creatinine or an antioxidant, to really make sure that they're, you know, starting to get a little sun exposure. So, so their eyes start to get a little bit used to the exposure to the sun. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and now that one of the new trends that I wanted to mention, I wasn't planning on mentioning this, but it's, it's definitely relevant, is monovision. So what's happening now is when the, uh, the cataract surgeons over the last two or three years, when they do cataract surgery, it used to be they just put clear lenses in, right? They take out the opaque lens, the cataract lens, they replace it with an artificial clear lens. It's like a clear plane of glass. Now what they're doing is they've made it prescription lenses. So it's almost like permanent contact lenses. So what they do is they'll take permanent lenses. If you have astigmatism or you, have, you need correction, near or far correction, they'll put them in. A lot of the times what they're doing is they put in a lens to correct that's one near and one far. And that's a big problem for a lot of people because it makes them woozy and stuff. So some big problem is a lot, I've had a lot of patients come in there, their uh, cataract surgeons didn't even tell them that they were putting corrective lenses in and they got this big whopping bill because of it. And, or they, you know, they, they told them, they're like, oh yeah, it's going to be great. You're going to see near far. They put one for near and one for far vision and it really messes up their brain and their equilibrium. 
So what I tell people is if you are considering getting lenses put in, uh, monovision specifically and near far, consider doing uh, contact lenses first for about two weeks. Try that, talk to your, your uh, op optoma optometrist, uh, have them give you a set of contact lenses so you can see what it's like to kind of go around with a near and a far before you commit to the implants. Um, my recommendation is always to go with clear lenses. Why? Because your prescription changes constantly, right? Our uh, eyeglass or contact lens prescription will change constantly. So if you put a fixed prescription lens in your eye, um, you know what I mean? They get a lot more money for the procedures, but again, it's not right for everybody. So it's being pushed a lot. Um, for some people, it's great. I know some patients who absolutely love it. Uh, and I know some people who can't stand it. They hate it and they're, 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 they're doing battle with their cataract surgeon to go back and get the, them removed and get the clear ones put in or you know, the monovision. So I just wanted to mention that first. If you're considering it, have a talk with your eye doctor, talk about the additional expense, Talk about, you know, the risks, you know, if you do have uh, posterior compartment neurodegenerative or acute issues, make sure your eye doctor has experience dealing with these conditions. Don't just, you know, thumb through these phone books anymore. Just kind of Google somebody who's in your area. Make sure you have the conversation that they're clear. If you have macular degeneration, uh, specifically if it's a bleeding issue, if you have like wet macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy or some type of inflammatory eye disease, you really want to make sure that you are um, you know, going to proceed with caution, right? You wanna, don't wanna do anything that's gonna make things worse. So uh, again, when we do get cataract surgery, okay, so you've made the decision that you're gonna get your cataracts uh, removed because they've become so opaque and you can't see and both you and your doctor agreed this is the best course of treatment. What do you do? So um, the, best re the best time to get cataract surgery is in the winter, if possible, or the fall, late fall, early spring, because we're not outside as much and there's not enough, not as much UV radiation, right? We talked about how UV radiation really affects the anterior compartment of the eye. So we want to limit UV exposure, uh, especially right after we've had, and, blue, and then blue light exposure too, right? Because your the, the lens has also been filtering out the blue light. So we really have to, uh, in the winter months, to watch the UV radiation that's coming to hit the back of the eye. Uh, we want to certainly load up on creatinine antioxidants at least six to 12 weeks before the procedure. Um, if you're not sure what loading up means, like if you, you're a patient of ours and you could come and you could get your creatinine antioxidants checked to see where you're at. If, you're, if your numbers are good and you're high and you have, you have a good saturation of creatinine antioxidants, great. My concern is the people who are going in for, cratinoid, for cataract surgery and their cratinoids are like zero or like, you know, 10 or 20,000, we need to be about 50, 60,000. You are at super, super high risk for having accelerated retinal and optic nerve generation if you don't have adequate cratinoid antioxidant protection, right? Super, super important for anybody who's going to get cataract surgery. Um, we talked about consider the conversation of clear non-prescription lens. If that's something, if you are going to try uh, per permanent implants or monovision, especially monovision, try it out before you get the surgery. Ask your optima optometrist or um, to, to give your optician a prescription, you know, try, try the contact lenses first, uh, at least for two weeks to make sure that, that you're okay with it. Um, of course, wear UVA, UVB protected wrap around sunglasses. These are flat front glasses. Why? Because they have flat front. You know, the Oakleys are the ones that wrap around, you know, the cool like kind of uh, matrix glasses because you, you want the, the rays bounce off surfaces, right? Both blue light and UV rays bounce off surfaces. So, you know, it's not like they're coming directly in. They can bounce off and come behind. So we want the full protection around the eyes. So guys, even if you're sitting like kind of indoor, outdoor, you're sitting like in a covered area, or if, even if you're sitting in front of a window and it's very sunny and your house is very lit, I do recommend wraparound sunglasses uh, when even indirect sun exposure. Uh, of course, blue light glasses. You can either go to your opticians and have them put a blue light coating on your glasses. If you don't wear glasses when you're in front of computer or in front of screens, you want to go on Amazon. They're like 20 or 30 bucks. You can buy a pair of clear glasses. My recommendation is you're gonna spend more than 15 or 20 minutes on screens, doing work on a computer, phone, TV, uh, use blue light protection. Very, very important. The other thing is set your screens, set your phones to night mode. That's blue light protection. And guys, 
TVs, your flat screen TVs, monitors, those are also blue light, right? So just keep in mind that the blue light radiation will come off of phones, tablets, laptops, desktops, and uh, monitors, game, it includes gaming monitors for all your kids like mine who you know, live on Xbox, especially with the pandemic, and uh, of course, television. So here's a little summary for you. So again, when we talk about treatment, we talked about the lens being primarily affected by UV radiation. So what do we do about it? How do we protect the lens from oxidative stress from which produces cataracts, right? And opacities. So the supplement we use primarily is called N-acetylcarnosine or NAC, all right? A lot of you guys have heard of that. Those of you guys who have retinitis pigmentosa have probably heard that they wanted to use NAC or they're recommending NAC. They were trying to see if it was gonna be useful for retinitis pigmentosa. It failed. Um, I figured, I not, I, we learned that years ago and here's how. So N-acetylcarnosine, NAC is a precursor to glutathione. Glutathione is one of the highest strongest, most powerful antioxidants in the body. They don't really help the back of the eye, but they, it helps the front of the eye. Um, it also helps the skin and the organs and the brain. Glutathione is very, very important for, it's one of the best, most powerful antioxidants in the body. However, as we talked about, the carotenoid antioxidants, which is a different type of antioxidants, it is what really protects the posterior compartment, all right, the retina and the optic nerve. So, so the N-acetyl cis-carnosine, NAC, uh, we have a supplement that we recommend called Can-C. Can-C eye drops are eye drops that you put in your eye that contain NAC. I have actually seen these in clinic reverse early stage cataracts. I was told when I went to school, you can't reverse cataracts. I wouldn't have believed it unless I saw it and I had confirma confirmation from some of my ophthalmic colleague friends who I sent patients to and they said, I don't see any cataracts. So mid to late state cataracts, maybe a little bit and you could hold it off, but you're probably not gonna totally reverse it. Um, there's oral liposomal glutathione. Now you can't take glutathione tablets. Let me back up for a minute. The reason we're having people take NAC is again, because NAC will basically convert into glutathione when it's taken in the body. When you take, try to take oral glutathione, like in a capsule or a pill, don't even bother. It basically gets, it disintegrates the second it hits the stomach, even into the esophagus. It doesn't even make it past the digestive, past, past the upper gut, okay? But they created a new product uh, called liposomal glutathione, which is the same company that makes the liposomal vitamin C that we're gonna talk about um, in a second. And glutathione, it's basically encased in a fat or a lipid, and it takes it right to the liver so it can be used. Um, now, I'm not vouching for the taste. Those of you guys who've taken glutathione, it has almost the, that a very hard, it's a sulfur-based supplement. So it has like that rotten egg smell. Uh, I take it periodically, but my God, I'm very good with taking supplements. And that is like, for those of you guys who are like kind of squeamish, uh, the the glutathione is kind of nasty tasting. Um, IV glutathione is another way to get it into your system that I like as well. Um, the vision mins are important. That's one of the products we have, uh, vision mins. And what vision mins are is their they're, they're uh, minerals, uh, magnesium, potassium, and what, they're electrolytes. And what electrolytes do is they help the body hold fluids, right? We talked a little earlier that uh, the, the lens uh, becomes opaque through oxidative stress, but also because of dehydration. When the body is too dehydrated, not enough electrolytes, it dries out. Part of the, the parts of the body that dry out fast are the lens. So we increase our water and our minerals um, to help the body to hold fluids and keep the crystalline lens hydrated. All right. The LipoVision drops. Those are also those are other drops that we use. It's um, mostly coconut. It's mostly coconut oil, but it has uh, some castor oil and some sesame oil in it too as well. We put very equal parts. Uh, and what that does is it coats the lens and it keeps the crystalline lens soft from becoming hard and rigid. And that will absolutely slow um, cataracts. It's also our, our formula we use for dry eye. So again, liposomal vitamin C. We talked about liposomal glutathione in a minute. Liposomal vitamin C is very, very important. Vitamin C is very important. Why? 
the highest concentrations of vitamin C in our body are in two, found in two places, the adrenal glands and the lens of the eye. So when we become vitamin C deficient, that can cause an accelerated situation where cataracts are accelerated. So vitamin C deficiency can lead to accelerated cataracts, okay? So liposomal vitamin C, it's the same thing. They come in like these little gel packs. So if you go on Amazon, it may be hard to find out. A lot of people are taking vitamin C because of the COVID situation, but it's the best form of vitamin C. The best form is, that's the best oral form. The best way to do vitamin C is through IV, all right? You know, we've talked about that. Um, uh, and same with glutathione is intravenously. IV is intravenous. But if you're going to take an oral supplement, the best way to take uh, glutathione is through the liposomal glutathione and the liposomal vitamin C, right? Not the powdered stuff, not the bioflavonoids. This is the best way to get it into your system where you get the most use value of it. Now let's move down to the, uh, the retinal photoreceptors, protecting nodes. That's where we use our carotenoid antioxidants, right? So in the anterior compartment of the eye, we want to use these the, the vitamin C, the NAC, uh, the glutathione, keep, use the minerals to stay hydrated. So really using a different type of antioxidant, the glutathione-based antioxidants for the anterior compartment in the lens to help pre prevent against cataracts. For the posterior compartment, the retina, the macula, the fovea, the optic nerve, for those posterior compartment neurological issues, we need to look at carotenoid antioxidants, which we just talked about. Vitamin A, retinal palmitate, beta carotene, lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, asanthin, et cetera. So we have our formulas. Our keratinovision is our primary formula that we use for, uh, you know, for saturating the eye with our uh, keratinoid antioxidants. You can also take it on your own. You can go to the health food store, take lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin. Now, here's the thing with keratinoid antioxidants. Uh, there's a lot of chatter, or some chatter, uh, among eye doctors and other uh, healthcare providers that are very concerned with high levels of vitamin A, uh, retinal palmitate, beta carotene, these keratinoid antioxidants. You know, we, for some of these conditions, we'll give up to even some 15, up to 25,000 IU a day <coughs> of, um, of these keratinoid antioxidants. And the concern is because they are fat soluble vitamins, which need to be processed in the liver, that the liver can get stressed out and you can have elevated liver enzymes or liver disease as a result of that. Now, I took that very seriously when I started recommending high doses of keratinoid antioxidants to my patients to the degree that we had them test their serum liver enzymes, which are primarily your ALT, and your AST. So those are, when you do a blood panel or a metabolic, comprehensive metabolic panel, those are your liver markers, your AST and your ALT. And if they're over about 30, um, that means you're starting to move into some, some liver stress. It means the liver detox, detox pathways are clogged up or they're inflamed or something like that. So I have tested hundreds and hundreds of patients when we first started doing this and putting patients on this high level of creatinine antioxidants, nope, I wouldn't put any patient on this without the guarantee that within six months, they would send me back. They go to their doctor within three to six months, get uh, at least get the liver enzymes done. Guys, I didn't see a single case of elevated liver enzymes. What I did see in about, in my 25 years of practice, I saw maybe five or six cases of patients whose skin started to turn a little yellow, all right? Just like this, the screen, the, the backdrop here. If you take too many carotenoids, your skin can start to turn a little bit orange. It doesn't mean anything. It's, you can actually kind of look a little healthier. Uh, people you know, look kind of bronze a little bit, look like you got a little tan. But you can see you're, if you're taking too much, your, your, your palms and your soles are gonna start to take on like a little bit of a yellow hue. Um, and that's just an indicator to back off a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, I've had some patients who think more is better. So I tell them, hey, take, you know, 10,000 and they take 40,000 because they think that's what, more is better and that's not necessarily the case. Um, so that's, I just want you guys to be aware of that. Uh, there is talk about it being uh, potentially harmful. I haven't seen that. I've tested it. I've looked at it. I don't have concerns. Of course, if there's somebody with hepatitis or cirrhosis or some type of liver disease, of course, we're going to keep that in consideration. 
The other thing I wanted to mention is that the Canavision CBD CBA product that we've uh, been using over the past eight months in our practice uh, is uh, protective for both the anterior compartment. It's a very, Canavision CBD from hemp oil is a very, 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 very powerful antioxidant for both the anterior compartment. Um, it amplifies glutathione absorption and manufacturing. It also uh, amplifies the carotenoid activity. So it really helps boost the effects of both the anterior compartment antioxidants and the posterior compartment antioxidants. So in terms of your antioxidant regimen, you want the Canavision, you want something for the anterior compartment, like at least the can see eye drops and take an acetylcarnosine, which is in a lot of our supplements we recommend, and then a good carotenoid antioxidant, like the Cratinovision that we have. Okay, so in summary, and then we're gonna get to your questions. Uh, appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, everybody gets cataracts eventually, all right? You live long enough right now, there is nothing that can reverse the protein cross-linking. Uh, so you're going to get them, you live long enough, um, they're going to be age-related. Uh, UV sunglasses went outside, um, especially if you have early stage or uh, cataracts or you have a degenerative eye condition. Everybody should wearing, be wearing uh, UV race glasses all the time anyway. Very, very important. The wraparounds, that, that's what we recommend. Again, blue light protection for your glasses, uh, on your glasses, or the clear lenses get from Amazon or wherever. Um, or set your phones to night mode, that's uh, black, that, that'll protect, reduce the amount of blue light coming off your screen. Uh, check and see if you're at high risk, if you have a pre-existing uh, retinal condition or optic nerve condition, macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, optic nerve atrophy, optic neuritis, uh, retinal vitreous detachments, these are all high risk situations. Load up on your creatinine antioxidants uh, before surgery, uh, use your uh, can see and acetylcarnosine, Canavision CBD to protect the anterior compartment as well. Um, and then get cataract surgery done in winter if possible. That is if you are in the Northern Hemisphere. Southern Hemisphere, of course, their winter is our summer. So you wanna do when the days are just shorter when they're cold, okay? So again, as I always say, uh, your vision is our mission. So we wanna invest daily in your vision, do things daily to protect your vision because it's an investment, all right? We wanna protect our eyes. We're living longer and longer and we are uh, vision creatures. Um, not over 90% of our uh, sensory input comes in through our eyes and uh, seeing is a good thing. So we wanna preserve that as much as possible. So now I'm gonna stop the screen share and I'm going to look at some of your questions here. Okay, let me go over to the uh, side chat bar real quick. Um, so is there a supplement? Yeah. So Sarah asked, is a supplement or anything that can reverse cataracts early stage internally? Again, we want to hydrate, use electrolyte minerals, we want to take NAC, carotenoid antioxidants, reduce the, the, the radiation exposure. Uh, and we want to take again, NAC, glutathione, vitamin C, all the supplements we recommended. Um, uh, then for bar bass, can you speak to essential oils and anti Oxidant supplements. Yeah, we talked about that. So the essential oils, guess which ones are going to help with cataracts? Drum roll, please. The citrus-based ones, right? Because for cataracts, we want the, the orange, the lemon, the grapefruit, any of the essential oils that are high in vitamin C or bioflavonoids, right? So uh, any of the, the, the pumpkin or any of the, any of the, the, even like cardamom, stuff like that, these will be really good that have high amounts of, of uh, NEC or vitamin C. Those are really going to protect our, our eyes. So that's for um, anterior compartment. For posterior compartment, we recommend frankincense. Um, for glaucoma or eye pressure issues, we like the greens, like the wintergreen peppermint. That has shown uh, to be effective in reducing eye pressure. They're actually using eye drops. Um, for scoli, some of you guys have heard about that who've had... Uh, uh, um, that's in the mint family that's been used to, to lower eye pressure. We've actually had people steam with that. Um, and you could actually create a light steam, uh, use like a humidifier and put like very, very small drops of uh, like really, really pure uh, mint oil. And that can help uh, with your eyes as well. Um, but again, the can C will drop, will help with dissolving the cataracts. That's all I know right now. You could do IV, glutathione, vitamin C, all that stuff is gonna be. Um, so the Canavision is oral drops. The can C in the LipoVision or eye drops. So the, the, the Canavision you put under your tongue, it's a CBD and you hold it until it dissolves. 
the uh, lipovision, you put a drop in each eye or on your eyelids before you go to bed, and the can C drops, you're gonna put two to three times a day in each eye. Um, and those are gonna be the NAC, N-acetylcarnosine, which is the antioxidant, okay? Um, let's see, so Patty. So I work with a lot of patients who are trying to reduce sugar intake, including natural sugars. So Patty, thank you so much for bringing this up. So sugars, guys, especially refined sugars, what, they oxidize really fast, just like the example we use with the apple, right? Fructose, sucrose, maltose, any sugars oxidize really fast and they increase oxidative stress. So as Patty mentioned here, reducing sugars, especially junky sugars, um, non-natural sugars like soda, candy, junk food, stuff like that are absolutely going to accelerate oxidative stress, which are also going to accelerate uh, the possibility of cataracts. So um, that will, uh, so with that, Patty, what I recommend, I like, I tell people not to have like juices. They can do juicing as long as the pulp is in there. Uh, the juice, it's the, the fiber in fruit that helps uh, neutralize the oxidative stress. So if you have like a glass of orange juice, there's so much sugar in there and it oxidizes really fast and it messes with dysglycemia and your insulin levels. But if you have like fresh squeezed orange juice or grapefruit juice and, or you're juicing and you're leaving all the pulp in there and everything like, yeah, it's a lot more filling, but that, that or you're eating whole fruit, right? What that does is that allows the, the fiber in there, takes it through your body and it stabilizes the blood sugar a little bit more. So it's less risky. But thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patty, for answering that. And wow, we got 65 people on. Awesome. All right. Let me see how I can, sorry, I'm shaking over here a little bit. Let me fire through the questions right here and I'll do the best that I can to answer those rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Blaine, you ready? Blaine, for all of you guys who don't know Blaine, Blaine is my amazing producer, technical, uh, awesome, amazing person that uh, helps us produce all these amazing, all this amazing content. So huge shout out to Blaine Glenn, who is uh, in the back end of all this stuff. Okay, questions. How do you know if you should have cataract surgery or just have prescription updated? So again, cataract surgery, cataracts are going to be identified by your eye doctor. They're going to let you know. And again, if you feel like it's, it's a hazy or foggy or you got a smudge that you want to clear up your glasses, you'll start to see signs of it. And ultimately, the doctors will tell you, you get to a point where you just lose function. Like you can't see. It's so hazy and so opaque that you can't see. All right. So um, the, the short answer to that is your doctor or your eye doctor will tell you when they, I don't have a quit in my office uh, to do an anterior compartment examination. So we refer out to that. We refer out to the eye doctors to, to evaluate the cataracts. Um, but they'll let you know. They'll let you know if it's a prescription or that. So I recommend if you're not sure, go check your check out with your optometrist. Uh, what is the best protocol to uh, avoid cataract surgery and how to avoid if it's too late? All right, we talked about that in detail, the supplements up there. Um, that we listed, of course, acupuncture too. Um, you know, that, that kind of goes without saying. Uh, we use acupuncture protocols for our patients who are, who are coming in to help deal with the cataracts. Um, but certainly um, that's gonna help with the blood flow and, and help with uh, slowing the, the progression of cataracts. But in addition to acupuncture, the supplements and the nutrition, uh, monitor oxidative stress, watching blue light protection and UV radiation are gonna be your, your best uh, preventative strategies. Most of the eye drops like Ocuran German, homeopathic one, have small amounts of preservatives. Is this harmful? I don't think so. Some people are sensitive to them, but it's going to be individuals. 95%, uh, maybe 90% of people are not going to have issues with them. Um, I don't really have a problem with them. If they irritate your eyes, you know, you may want to try something else. Uh, but I don't really have an issue with most of those. Uh, I believe there are various types of lenses that use for contact surgery, which other, okay, I talked about that, the various types of lenses. Uh, my recommendation is go with clear lenses. If you wanna try uh, prescription lenses, keep in mind that your prescription most likely will change at some point. So you're gonna have to go back to wearing glasses anyway. If you're considering monovision, put your contacts, get contact lenses first to kind of test drive that experience or that procedure. Um, uh, Dr. Schulte's Albright Wires, cayenne, pepper. Um, I'm not huge on that. <laughs> um, a lot, I know a lot of people are putting things like cayenne in their eyes. Uh, they're putting 
um, with apple cider vinegar. I'm not big on that. I, I think it's pro-inflammatory. Um, I do know some patients who, who have had good results with it. I don't think you can dose it very well. And I, I, I think the inflammation from it can cause a little bit more problem. I have better strategies. Um, I know about it. I've had patients that used it. I've tried it myself. It's not the most fun experience when you're doing it. Um, but I have a lot of other things. I actually like MSM eye drops a little bit better um, and the other eye drops that we mentioned. And again, there are a lot of different eye drops uh, specifically uh, for each condition. You know what I mean? So it's not that I, I, there is one eye drop that I like for everything. There are different eye drops that are going to be useful for different conditions and different circumstances. Um, Mr. Praveen, how are you, sir? How much uh, dose with the brand CBD with the eye drops. So with the C so again, the CBD guys, thank you for asking these questions because it helps me um, get a little bit more specific uh, and correct that. So the CBD does not go in the eyes, guys. It's very acidic. It'll burn the eyes. So don't put CBD in your eyes. The CBD is oral and it'll go through your system and get into your, your body. Um, the only thing we use for the eye drops is the, uh, the NAC and we use the LipoVision eye drops. The Canavision or the CBD is directly under the tongue. What Chinese medicine? Uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So retinitis pigmentosa, we have Chinese herbal formulas. Uh, we modify, again, we deal with the underlying causes, but there are formulas like Chichu Di Huanglan, Mingmu Di Huanglan, um, a few other formulas that we use, but those are the primary ones that we use in modified forms for, um, for retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, and again, that, that's a whole thing. In my book, Healing Your Eyes with Chinese Medicine and the Ophthalmology in uh, Chinese Medicine, those books have detailed descriptions of Chinese herbal formulas that we use specifically for RP and any other uh, conditions. Yeah, acupuncture points. Again, we have trainings for acupuncturists uh, who want to do electroacupuncture, microacupuncture 48, which is currently the gold standard for treating uh, eye conditions with acupuncture. Um, so let's see here, Miss Nancy, moving down. Uh, what about doing one eye at a time? Yeah, yeah, I like that. Most, most of the time they do one eye at a time. Uh, I have one eye worse than the other. Doctors did not suggest uh, all the good things you did. Um, yeah, th again, that's the reason, <laughs> guys, that's the reason we're here. A lot of the cataract surgeons and eye doctors just don't know about this stuff. And with all due respect, it's just that in their curriculum, they don't study it. Uh, they're surgeons, right? They, they put their time and effort and energy into surgery. Would it be great to find, you know, some surgeons who know this? And if you have a surgeon, uh, a cataract surgeon that you know that might be open to this, uh, absolutely, please, you know, forward our information. Hopefully they will uh, find use value in this information. Um, after cataract surgery, clear laser placement, I have very dry eyes. Try the LipoVision. Try the LipoVision should really, really help with the dry eyes. One of our best products and um, we get great results with it, uh, either in the eye before bed, uh, or just put on the eyelids during the day and the oils will, will, will kind of get in. It's very common to have dry eye post cataract surgery. And we actually created LipoVision just for the dry eye and uh, pre and post-op cataract surgery. Um, and Ms. Roberta, how long do you recommend using can see eye drops ongoing? It's ongoing. Yeah, uh, they say at least three months. The manufacturers say use it for three months minimum before even making a, a decision if it's working or not. Um, uh, Christine, I live in Colorado, Colorado, where the CBD supplements are ready, readily easy to get. How many MGs of CBD? Okay. So for a early MG, my recommendations for CBD is for a, a therapeutic dose for adults, no less than 150 milligrams per day of full spectrum CBD. Full spectrum means it has 0.03 or less percent of THC in it which allows it to cross the blood brain barrier and the blood retinal barrier. Now I get some people have to do testing, some people have jobs or some people just whatever, for whatever reason, don't want the THC. That's fine. It's not as useful, it's not as strong or potent. However, you can use broad spectrum CBD, which means they have everything except they've extracted the THC out. For those of you guys who don't know, the THC in higher amounts is what gets you high in cannabis. Hemp has 0.3% or less. You're not going to feel anything. Our CBD, Cannavision, is very, very potent. Uh, it's 2,500 milligrams. So each shot, if you fill up the dropper, you squeeze the dropper and you fill it up, put it on your tongue, you're getting 86 
milligrams, all right? So that is the absolute minimum that we recommend uh, per day. You know, we have most pa patients we have taking twice a day. It's about 150. For starters, we have people taking one drop a full day. Why? Because it can relax you. You know, for some people very sensitive to CBD, it'll knock you out. Like it's one of the best things for sleep and anxiety. So um, if you have more questions on the, on the CBD or the Cannavision or anything like that, uh, feel free to, to email me or, or, or text me or anything like that or, or DM me. But yeah, I'll get into that a little bit more specifically. We're actually going to do a whole session on uh, medical cannabis and CBD and CBA and how that all works for the eyes. If you guys want, I've already done a couple of videos on that. If you go to our YouTube page where these are going to be all posted as well, uh, we have some, some lectures that I've done on um, CBD and uh, 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 cannabis and, and uh, hemp oil and how, it, how it, it's useful for the eyes. Um, uh, essential oils topically, we use those. Uh, I, mostly below and in the temples. I don't use them so much on top of the eye anymore because it could drip. You do not want that stuff in your eye. It's very, very potent. So topically, forehead, back of the eyes, under, around the eyes. Just make sure it's not too close to the eye. You don't want that in your eye. Uh, Mr. Ko, uh, can you share what Chinese terms will help with cataracts? Yes. So acupuncture and acupressure helps. We do have um, our I Qigong exercises coming out soon. Uh, acupuncture can help. And again, the Chinese herbs that help, that are actually in my books, that help with cataracts, focus on the kidneys and the lungs. So uh, those two systems, nourishing the fluids of the kidneys and the lungs, that's the strategy that we use in addition to controlling inflammation. Again, that's a little bit you know, off topic and for those people who know Chinese medicine, but we primarily focus on nourishing the fluids with Chinese medicine and, uh, and diet therapy. So that's the strategy we take and there are certainly uh, formulas that help uh, bolster and boost and nourish the fluids for uh, the lung and kidney system in Chinese medicine. Um, Let's see. All right. Do you have any exercise? Yes. So Eva, so uh, stay tuned. We uh, just finished our I Qigong I exercise series. That's our I yoga, I Qigong, I exercises. We just finished that. We're going to release that in, I don't know if it's going to be the end of August or beginning of September, but it's definitely coming very soon. I know that we, we just finished the edits. We're getting everything lined up. We're going to be launching that real soon. Um, yes. Lecture acupuncture for retinitis uh, RP, that's the research we did with Johns Hopkins Praveen. So that's absolutely, we, for RP, we pretty much combine electroacupuncture and the microacupuncture 48 system. Um, we are going to be using oxygen therapy. We just purchased a hyperbaric oxygen chamber that we're going to be using in our clinic as well for our eye patients. And I'm really, really excited about it. So that is what we have going on. That is the questions that I see. Um, let me look. We got a couple more questions dropped in here in the chat box over here. Um, yeah, so the CBD Cannavision bottle says five. So you fill it up. It's one milligram, all right? When you squeeze the bottle, it fills up, put it under your tongue. Uh, that's 86 milligrams. So you do two of those, about 160. Start small. Do one drop in the evening under your tongue. Um, we just got a new shipment. We can't keep that stuff on the shelf. Our Cannavision, we're going through like wildfire. So um, we did just get a new shipment in. We were out for about a week and a half. So those of you guys have been waiting, we appreciate your patience. Uh, my cannabis from Al, my cannabis nurse says that cannabis reacts with pharmaceuticals. Yes, it does not react, uh, interact with pharmaceutical uh, glaucoma drops. So there are absolutely, uh, I just finished a medical cannabis training course that I did last year. Uh, so I am a certified medical cannabis consultant. Uh, we are well aware of all the, er, all the, the medicines, the pharmaceuticals, the drugs, uh, interactions, what effects. To, to the, I have not read anything that has showed eye pressure medication has any interactions with uh, CBD, so you're totally safe there. There are some rumors out there, too, that uh, CBD can actually raise eye pressure. Don't believe it. We checked it in clinic. We've had probably about five or 600 people on Canavision right now. I have hundreds of patients with glaucoma. We put them on the Canavision. We tested them before they were on the Canavision. We put them on the Canavision, which is the CBD. We tested them, no increase in eye pressure. So I could say, based on my own clinical research, uh, with confidence that we have not seen any increase, uh, at least with our product, our CBD product. So um, I personally uh, have no concerns uh, unless somebody's on anticonvulsants, blood pressure medication sometimes because CBD can actually lower the blood pressure. 
Um, and obviously people are on like, you know, really, really uh, heavy, heavy, hardcore, like bipolar medication, or as we said, uh, a seizure medication. Those are the only real medications you have to watch out for. Blood pressure, seizure, seizure medications, uh, heavy antidepressants, anti-anxiety, um, anything like that, anti-convulsives. Those are really the medications we need to watch for. Okay, guys. So we went about 10 minutes over, which is, is fine. I really wanted to get to your questions. I want to thank you guys for joining us from wherever you may be. And uh, join in. We're going to be doing these sessions bi-weekly. So the, in two weeks from now on Thursday night, don't have the date, we'll be sending it out. Again, this session was recorded. We're going to send out a recording to you guys. If you have any any friends, colleagues that you want to send this to, please, we're gonna be posting them inside the groups. We're gonna be putting them up on our YouTube page. This is, we wanna get this information out there because as you guys see, this is not common information that people are talking about. So if you have any other questions, any other comments, or even we'll take some complaints, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you again, have a great night, enjoy your weekend, stay safe, and we will see you soon. Bye everybody.